might reflect on our own lives and feel that we are quite incapable of sharing the faith with our family, friends, co-workers, regardless of whether they're atheist, agnostic, new age, spiritual but not religious, Buddhist, Sikh, Hindu, everything that there is, we, we just don't really know what to do. Does the book of Acts give us a clue on how to go about engaging in these kind of conversations in a way that's respectful but also effective and where both parties benefit? As we finish up, as we finish up our series on Acts tonight, we're going to find ourselves looking at what is probably Paul the Apostle's most influential speech for the modern church. We use this speech to train missionaries when they go overseas to share the faith. This speech has the answer to our question. And whilst the content of his speech is really good, it's more the methodology that underpins his speech that we're going to look at. So tonight's a bit different from our normal sermons. Tonight we're really focusing hard on application, like a step-by-step process. But before we do that, we do have to look at some theory so we can use that practice well, right? So we're going to do three things tonight. We're going to look at the context of Paul's situation. We're going to see how his methodology um, is informed by his context and how the methodology informs his context. And then we're going to look at how we can apply Paul's, uh, Paul's way of doing things to Brisbane here, like this week, as you go into your life. So let's read the story that we're going to see. It's from Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. This should be up on the screen. While Paul, was walk- while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the people in Athens and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but discussing and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that in everything they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. 
Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman called Damaris, and a number of others. The year is probably 51 AD, 18 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Paul was in Athens. He's just escaped persecution in another Greek city, and now he is waiting for his friends to arrive. At this age, sorry, at this time, Paul's age is somewhere between 41 and 51. We got that 10-year gap because we don't know exactly when he was born, but we got the the general vicinity. Uh, Paul despite being a Jew, was actually born in Turkey. And he was born in a part of Turkey which was heavily influenced by Greek culture. So so Paul was well aware of Greek culture. He speaks Greek fluently, although not quite fluently enough for the Athenians because they're pretty arrogant about how well you speak Greek. You've got to be perfect. Um, I'm saying that about ancient Athenians. I have no idea about modern Athenians. Um, And so, despite that, Paul was overall quite well prepared for his task here in the Areopagus. In some ways, we are actually a bit like Paul, aren't we? Because of all the cultures in the Bible, the Greek culture is the one that we are the most familiar with. Let's think about it. Who did the Greeks worship? Zeus, Hera, Athena, Aphrodite, Hercules, Poseidon, Hades. Um, They... Well, we know them from things like Disney's Hercules, Assassin's Creed, Percy Jackson, and The Lightning Thief. I don't know about you, but when I, was a, when I was a young kid, I used to like religiously watch this show called like Clash of the Titans or something on ABC, and it was just like these like Greek heroes versing the gods, and I loved it. And so like I'm pretty familiar with them. And the Athenians also believed in the Amazonians, who some of us uh, might recognise inspired Wonder Woman. Um, they believed in Narcissus, the guy who died from looking at himself in the mirror for too long. Uh, they got Medusa, the Minotaur, they got Pam, their dude who's like half horse and half man. Um, they idolized the Battle of Troy, which you all know Brad Pitt and Orlando Bloom starred in. Um, yeah, we're pretty much Greek, let's just be honest. Um, so we're very familiar with them. This is the place that Paul was going to. Um, yeah, and Athens was a city full of idols and temples. Of course, we all know the Parthenon, right? It's on like Getaway and all the Greek travel brochures. But in front of the Parthenon was this huge 15 meter gold bronze kind of statue that reflected the sun of Athena, goddess of war. And its marketplace and its ports and its streets were filled with idols and altars and little temples where you would burn like incense to the gods on your way to buy some meat for the family dinner. They were everywhere. But Paul didn't only find that. He found an altar. And we actually know from archaeology that there were numerous ones of these altars dedicated to gods that they might have missed just in case. They really wanted to be sure. In fact, in an earlier time in Greek history, there was a plague going around and they sacrificed like the goats or the gods they knew and nothing happened. So they just started building more and more altars to different gods, being like, all right, God one, did we miss you? And goat, God two, did we miss you? Goat. And they just kept doing that until the plague ended, right? They were so scared that they might have missed a god. So obviously Paul's pretty distressed, right? Like, there's idols everywhere. Where he grew up, there, like, idols just aren't a thing for Jews. But he doesn't let that get to him. He's in Athens, he's waiting for his friends, he's getting to work. And so he goes to the marketplace and starts to talk about Jesus. And he pretty quickly ends up in some debates with philosophers. Athens, back in that day, was famous for philosophy. It was the Harvard, it was the Oxford, it was the Yale of the world, in the ancient world. That's where you went if you wanted to get your PhD. That's where you went to become a teacher if you wanted a big name for yourself. If you've been to Athens, you can go anywhere in the world and charge whatever you like, right? Because you've been from Athens. You studied there, you're famous. And the world's greatest philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, all came from Athens. And as far as the ancients were concerned, no one was smarter, no one was wiser than Socrates. And that is going to be really important in our story very shortly. So Paul encounters two groups of philosophers and 
they, they don't really like him and they call him a babbler, they say he's advocating foreign gods, whatever. But the last charge is really interesting. Advocating for foreign gods. We're like, hang on a minute. Don't the Greeks just like build altars to every god? Like, what's the problem? The Greeks were more than happy to accept new gods. They were just concerned that a new god might overthrow an old god. So they were like pretty careful about which new gods they let in. And so Socrates was actually accused of advocating for foreign gods, bringing in new gods, and he was killed for it. And so the philosophers, they get Paul, and they're about to take him to this place called the Areopagus. And we need to find out a bit about these philosophers. So they're in two groups. One of them is called Epicureans. So basically, if you're an Epicurean, your sole desire in life is to seek pleasure. But they do not define pleasure by like hooking up and going to wild parties and drinking. For an Epicurean, pleasure is defined as peace of mind and freedom from drama. So they basically didn't do anything. Right? <laughs> That's it, what the Epicureans. They rejected all the gods of the Greeks, but they were not atheists. They believed that there was this God out there who was philosophically ideal, but you couldn't know about him, really. Like, you could know about him, but you couldn't know him. This God did not interact in our affairs. The second group is the Stoics. The Stoics were like, the key to happiness is just to accept that you cannot control your life, and whatever happens to you, you just go to take in your stride. The Stoics did believe in the gods, but in a modified sense. So they get Paul, and they take him to this place called the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus is a court. So, way back, early in Greek history, the Areopagus tried Socrates on the charge of introducing foreign gods and had him killed. So obviously it's a bit like, oh, Paul being charged on foreign gods, he's going to the place that kills dudes to talk about foreign gods. Not looking great so far. Except that this time it seems that the Areopagus isn't really killing people anymore. They're more like a university accreditation board. So you go there and you give your spiel and they're like, all right, you're not subversive, you're not overdrawing the old gods, you, you can stay. You can take whatever you want, just don't break any laws, right? And so Paul's going and Areopagus has this intellectual interest in him. So he's on trial in a sense. He's on trial to not get kicked out of the city. He's on trial for his teaching license, but he's not on trial for his life. So, and it's at this moment that Paul begins his speech to the Areopagus, which is full of very elite Athenian citizens. And this speech brings together all of our talk on Epicureans and Stoics and Socrates and idols and all that. So, you'd be glad to know we just finished our first mission for the night. Finding the context of what's going on in this story, all right? Now, our second goal. We're going to answer our question, how should we evangelize by looking at Paul's method, which is going to interact with all the context we just learnt about. And we're gonna see why it matters that he's like Socrates. So Paul starts off his speech and he commends the Athenians for being very religious. You know, this is probably a good thing. You're on trial, right? Like you wanna build some rapport with the guys that are gonna mark your assignment. You know, you're there, you're trying to build some rapport. And he does this. And he says that, like, I notice you're very religious. But he's not necessarily endorsing their religion. He's just endorsing the fact that they know their spiritual stuff and you should dedicate yourself to it. He, but he hasn't said what that is yet. And then he says, so I've been walking around, I've been examining religion, seeing what's here, and I noticed an altar to an unknown God. And he sees this part of their religion. He's like, ah, there's a bridge here. I can use this to steer the conversation towards Jesus. So he sets himself up to tell them about the God they have missed. Paul then says that God is the creator of heaven and earth. And so far, this isn't controversial. The Epicureans believe that. The Stoics believe that. The average Greek who wasn't into philosophy but just preferred mainstream like Seuss religion, they believe that. Um, yeah, so no one's been offended yet. And then Paul goes on to say that God does not live in temples built by human hands. And the Epicureans are like, yeah, good. You tell them, Paul, how can a God live in a temple? How can a God be constrained? Yeah, you tell everyone that we're right. 
And the Stoics are like, we agree with you, but temples are really cool. We, we'll go to the temple anyway. The average Greek is probably a bit like, uh, Paul, if you get rid of temples, the gods are going to be angry. But so far, he's managed to bring everyone along with him. All right? No one's rejecting him yet. Paul then says that God created one man, Adam. And all of humanity came from Adam. The Greeks, in theory, accepted that all humanity came from like one origin point. But they believed there was maybe like four or five original, maybe six original humans, and that everyone came from them. So what Paul's saying is it's distinctive. He's not giving up what makes our faith unique. But at the same time, he's not introducing points that is outside of the realm of believability for them. Like a Greek could change his mind about how many original humans there were without forfeiting his religion. Paul then says that what God has done, he has done so that people would find him. All the Greeks believed it was very possible to know about God academically. In fact, that's half the stuff what the the philosophers did. They talked about the gods and what he was like. But Paul isn't just saying he can know God academically. He's saying he can know God personally. And the Stoics are like, you're right. The Greeks, average Greeks are like, yep. But the Epicureans are like, no. You cannot know God personally. But to prove his point, Paul then does something which to us seems very scandalous. He quotes this line, For in him we live and move and have our being. Where does this line come from? It comes from a hymn, a worship song to Zeus, high god of Greece. Now, Paul cuts the quotation off just before Zeus is mentioned by name. <laughs> All right. He then goes and quotes another thing from a Greek poet, so kind of like a lower level scripture, that says, we are all gods of spring. What god is this poet referring to? Zeus. What is Paul doing? Isn't this the equivalent of me coming up here with the Quran or a Buddhist prayer chant and reading to you from that? Yes, it is. That is exactly what Paul is doing. But he's not doing it in a way that's wrong. What he is doing, he's using their religion to say, you already believe the basic premise which I am now setting out. And everyone's like, yep, all right, we agree. And the basic premise is this. We are God's children. We're in his image. And from this basic premise, which everyone agrees with, Paul then goes on to say, if then we all agree that we're God's children, we're all in God's image, how can God be like a gold or silver or wooden statue that we made? The idea that God wasn't in an idol did exist, but was pretty radical in ancient Greece. So Paul has really deviated from the commonly held beliefs here. Paul then says that everyone is going to face judgment. Not controversial to the Greeks, they had Hades, so they believe that. But then he says, Jesus rose from the dead, and that's the sign that a judgment is coming. Way back in Greek history, in a period where Paul and his companions would have thought was ancient, so very, very old, the Greeks did believe that some people could be resurrected to torment the living. And so when they buried them, they buried them with stones on them, so that if they resurrected, they couldn't get up. This idea had now gone out of vogue in Greek culture. The idea of resurrection now seems pretty ridiculous. And that is why Paul saved it to last. He left his most controversial points till after everybody had come to the same basic premise. And that's where he launched from. Because if he just started talking about Jesus straight away, about a resurrection, they would have dismissed him instantly. But he's built some common grounds with the Greeks. At the end of this, the Areopagus is, on the whole, quite curious. They respect him. They know that he knows their religion. 
They know that he understands them. They know that he understands where they're coming from. Most of the Areopagus want to listen to him again. Some of them convert. But some of them sneer at him, it says, when he mentions the resurrection. And this is really important. When Socrates went to the Areopagus, they disagreed with him and killed him. Since then, the ancient world developed this myth. If you went to the Areopagus and you did a good job but failed, you are now like Socrates. So the author of Acts has gone out of his way to list that Paul was charged on the same charge as Socrates. Paul was tried by the same institution as Socrates. Paul understands the same philosophy that Socrates' students understood. And Paul was rejected by the same institute that rejected Socrates. Paul is the new Socrates. In the same way that Paul used Greek culture for his own purpose to lead people to Jesus, the writer of Acts, who is writing to a Greek audience, is using a hero the Greeks accepted, showing that Paul is the new and greater hero, and he's using Greek culture to lead people to, lead people to Jesus. So that's all about theory. It's now time to apply that theory and get some application. We see that Paul has shown that we should interact with the scriptures and worldviews of people we want to share the gospel with, but in a way that does not compromise what we believe ourselves. We're not losing our distinctiveness. If we lose our distinctiveness, we may as well just go join their religion. There's no point having this conversation, right? We're still going to be distinctive. But here's the problem. Most of us are not experts in Buddhist philosophy. We're not experts in atheist philosophy. We're probably just not experts in most philosophy. Philosophy is hard. But can we still take Paul's approach if we don't master every single religion that we're going to come across? Yes. Because whilst Paul uses an intellectual connection, we can use an emotional connection. And we're going to go through four different groups. Muslims, Sikhs, graduates from private schools, and that's going to sound weird, but I went to a private school, and they have their own distinctive beliefs, right? And the most common belief in Australia, it's got a fancy name, but when I explain it, you'll understand. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism, and we'll get to that a bit later. But we do need a way to connect emotionally with people, right, if we're going to use Paul's method. And... There's a very simple way we're going to do this. We're going to use one story, which we can use of all four groups. And this story is the story of the prodigal son. So if you want to take some notes now on how to use this methodology, you're more than welcome. So in the story of the prodigal son, there's a farmer, a rich farmer. He's got two sons. The youngest son says to the dad, I want my inheritance now, which basically is saying, I wish you were dead. And the father gives him the inheritance, and the son goes off and blows the money on wild living in a distant country. The son ends up broke, and he has to work, and he finds a job feeding pigs. He's so hungry, he recognizes that pigs eat better than him. He wants to eat what the pigs are eating. And he thinks to himself, my father's servants never went hungry. And so he decides he's going to go home, and he's going to ask to be taken back, but not as a son. He's like, I can't be taken back as a son. It's too late for that. I'm going to go back as a servant. I'm going to get a job from dad because I can't be a son to dad anymore. So he goes on his way home, and the father sees him. Now, maybe you would think the father turns his back, but no. The father sees him, and he bolts. He runs to see him, and the son says to him, Dad... I sinned against heaven, I sinned against you. But before he can say to his dad, can I have a job, take me as a servant and as your son, the dad says to his servants, go, get a ring, get the nicest clothing, get the best steak on because we're going to have a party. Because my son who was dead is now alive, my son who was lost is now found. And the two key themes in this story 
that we can use is this. The son is a son. Or if it was a daughter, the daughter is a daughter. All right? Servanthood is not a status for the, for the sinner in this story. And the second is grace. The son did not have to earn his way back to his father's household. He was just accepted. So let's apply this story to our first group, which is Muslims. And I want to apply it to them first because Muslims have their own prodigal son story. And combining uh, these two stories together is going to show us a distinct difference between them. And when we see this difference and how to relate our story to their story, it's going to help us then move on to the next three groups. So this is the story um, that the Muslims have. It's found in Sahih Muslim, which is like a sequel to the Quran. So chapter 37, verse 6610, it says, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of a servant than with what you guys are finding a lost camel in the waterless desert. When he, that is the servant, this sinful servant, draws near to me by the span of a hand, I draw near to him by the span of one arm. When the servant comes to me by the span of one arm, I come to him with the span of two arms. When he draws to me walking, I draw to him running. This story, at first glance, does seem very similar to our prodigal son story, doesn't it? And, um, yeah, but, and at first glance it does. But when we look deeper, we see there's a bit of a difference. In our story, the prodigal son comes back and is accepted as a son. In this story, what, what does it say? It says, when my servant comes running. Christianity does have the language of servants for us, but we are still sons and daughters. In Islam, you can never be more than a servant. There was a period in Islamic history where a significant proportion of Muslims um, tried to argue that you could in fact be a child, a son or daughter of Allah, and they were kicked out of the community. It did not go well for them. Nowadays, Muslims, particularly Muslims in Australia, um, they long for intimacy with Allah, they long for a son or daughter relationship, and they want it, but they can't justify it, because they know they're only a servant. So when we speak with them, like you don't, got, you don't have to remember this prodigal son story, I mean if you do, it's great, because it would help, but you don't need to remember that, you just need to remember like, what's the emotional place that they're coming from? They want intimacy with their God, but they can't have it. But our God offers the intimacy that they are looking for. Some Muslims still reject the idea of having a son or daughter relationship. And so there's something else that this prodigal son story provides for them. So in Islam, if you meet all of Allah's requirements to get to heaven, you can still go to hell just because he doesn't feel like letting you in. This causes significant spiritual anxiety, as you would imagine. Because you really have no say in where you go. You can spend your whole life working you never get there. That's why what I used to say to my Muslim friends in high school, uh, so-and-so, are you, are you going to heaven? And he says, I hope so. And he'd say, are you going to heaven? And I'd say, I know so. Not because I'm a good person, but because the prodigal son story tells me I'm accepted without having to earn it. And it tells me that the God of the Bible is not going to change his mind. The biggest drawer for Muslims to Christianity, and I know particularly in Indonesia too, is knowing that you do not have to be worried about whether you're going to heaven or hell. So as Christians, that's the message that we can bring them through the prodigal son story. So I hope you can see where we're going with this, how we can use the prodigal son story to meet people where they're emotionally. Our second group is the Sikhs. So um, the Sikhs are becoming a larger and larger population in Bracken Ridge in Fitzgibbon. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's good because it's more people we can share the good news with. Um, they're often confused for Muslims, but you can tell the difference because if a man is wearing a silver bangle, a sole silver bangle on his arm, he's a Sikh. The Sikh are well known in India for their charitable works. They're very keen on feeding the poor. I had a friend um, in high school who was a Sikh. I learned 
a lot about the secret religion from him. Probably didn't do quite as good a job sharing Christianity. Um, but I did learn a lot about his religion from him. Uh, I do not have a quote from the scriptures. So I'm not closing Paul's method perfectly here because I haven't studied their religion in detail, like Islam. But they do believe this, that grace is something that you earn. Grace is not something that's given gracefully. So the prodigal son's story for the Sikh is much like for the Muslim. You do not have to earn your way into the father's household. You just have to put your trust in Jesus. So that brings us then onto our third group. Which we all had a good laugh at, private school graduates. So maybe it's a little bit different for like guys who went to Lutheran schools, because I've been to Lutheran and Catholic, but I can assure you that guys who go to Catholic school, right, we're given a lot of religious instruction and none of it is really good. Everyone comes away with the idea that God is a harsh taskmaster and that God does not love you. So I remember very distinctly one day, I was sitting by the lockers at lunch and I don't know how we got into it, but we're having this conversation about religion. And I said to the guy, you know God does not expect you to do a certain number of good things to get to heaven, right? He's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, God just loves you the way you are, mate. You don't have to be perfect. And it just blew his mind. I've got a friend from Argentina who grew up in a very similar circumstance. She left Christianity because she could not bear the guilt that came with being a Christian in that country. It's, it's the most popular religion, but everyone feels so guilty, like God is constantly hating them. And so I told her, you know, the prodigal son, like Jesus, he can wipe away guilt like that. You don't have to be a perfect person to come to him. And she was left in tears. Christianity is so unique in its grace. And that's something I really, if nothing else, would just like to impart to you tonight. That grace is an offer, and that is the way we meet with people. And particularly those from private schools who have been taught the exact opposite of grace. So this is our final group. Our final group is the most common belief group in Australia. It's got a fancy name. Scholars call it moralistic therapeutic deism, which essentially means that people believe they are a good person and that you should be a good person. They believe God exists. They don't know which God, but if you really press them on it, they would probably say the God of Christianity, but they have no idea what that actually means. And they would say God does not interfere in our world except for when I happen to feel like he's a vending machine. And then I will pray to him when I need something and then hopefully he answers. The prodigal son story does a few things uh, of people who have this belief. It shows that God does in fact have an interest in them. My favorite bit about the prodigal son story is that the father runs to his son. He doesn't stand at the porch like, oh, it took you long enough. You know, he's not standing there like that. He runs to see his son. God does have an interest in the people in this country and they do not need to feel like God does not care about them. The second thing it does is it also questions the idea that they're good people. A lot of people will on the surface project that they're good people. You ask them are you a good person, but um, if you go to parties where people do, do have a bit too much to drink and they start pouring themselves their life out to you, it's very easy to recognize that people know deep down that they're not okay. And the prodigal son's story speaks to their need and says, and it speaks to our need too, it says, that's okay. You don't need to be perfect. The prodigal son was not perfect, but he was accepted. This is when grace takes hold of their heart and they realize that they are wanted. So we've done it. We've applied Paul's methodology. We've had a look at how to share our faith with the people in our lives. And as I invite the band to come up now, I think there's one final thing that we should say. When we evangelize, we should be informed by the attitude that the prodigal son story gives us. We do not evangelize like other religions do for the sake of getting merit to get approval by God. We share the love of Jesus because we have already experienced it. We are not doing it to get brownie points. We're doing it because our heart is overflowing. And for that, we need to dig deep 
into the grace that Jesus offers us first. And that should be the place from which we go about to share. And if, lastly, we do not care about people to share them, to share the gospel with them. We share the gospel because we care about people and we would care about them regardless of whether they accepted it and regardless of whether they spoke bad about Christianity for the rest of their lives. Because that's the attitude of the father and the prodigal son, to love regardless of whether they accept us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this series on Acts, which has uh, shown us your, your power and your glory, but your love and the love that you have for the people uh, in, this, in this suburb, in this nation, in this world, and that you have given your Holy Spirit to empower us to work and to show people who you are. We pray that this methodology, um, which is just one amongst many, Lord, will um, be rooted in our minds and it's something that we can draw on alongside prayer and walking with you to be able to share our faith um, with those we care about. We ask all this in Jesus' name.